Welcome to Inspiration and Adaptation. I'm Asia Freeman, Artistic Director of Bunnell Street Arts Center on Denina and Supiak land, where Bunnell Street Arts Center stands. It's a real pleasure to be here today with Dr. Allison Kelleher, artists Amber Webb, Melissa Shagnoff, and Holly Nordland to talk about decolonizing the body. We'll begin with some self-introductions. Um, if you wouldn't mind starting us out, Allison, thank you. I'd be happy to. Good evening, everyone. Allison Kelleher, uh, my name is uh, Nosiak or Little Flower Kazignok. That's a family name from King Island. I was named in the hospital during um, my vaccines as a childhood vaccines in Nome, Alaska, where I was born and raised. Danaka Tlada Tachna Sneezni, Nalahado Hutsin Sadan Salet. I'm Koyakan Athabaskan, and my family's from Nalahado in the upper Inoko Mud River Flats. Ina A Trudy Dumplings Hildebrand, Kelleher Beuza, Ita A Patrick Brendan, Kelleher Beuza. Grand Forks Listo. So I'm living in Grand Forks, working at the University of North Dakota, trained as a family and integrative medicine doc. And I'm also learned to be a traditional healer and tribal doctor since I was a pre-K. So I started off walking on backs and I'm an advocate for including indigenous perspectives in research and especially in medicine. So Anabasi Kleanapak, Asia, and everyone else joining me here today, I'm grateful. Thank you, Allison. Amber Webb, could I invite you to provide a little self-introduction? Uh, Chamai, everybody. Um, I'm Amber Webb. I'm uh, from Chugyung, Alaska, and um, a Yupik name that was given to me as an adult was because um, I'm uh, somebody told me I was kind of like an old woman so I took that as a, as a great compliment and um, uh, my family's Yupik and possibly um, like maybe Sukhbiak we're not really sure um, and I'm an artist and I just recently started as a health aide and I've been uh, doing a lot of work around like uh, how how art art and healing and I don't know everything kind of coincides so thank you Amber and thanks for your leadership in um, the work that you do and in suggesting the topic of this dialogue today Welcome, Holly Nordland. Hello, Vlalomi. Vanga Atara Mitchiktok, Kikik Dover Mirunga. My name is Holly Nordland, and I'm originally from Kotzebue. Um, love these ladies you have here. I'm an artist and a graphic designer. And I think for this particular discussion, I'm a traditional tattooer uh, for Inuit tattooing traditions and apprenticeships. So um, yeah, that's me. Kuyana, Asia. Kuyana Holly, thank you so much for joining us. Melissa Shaganoff, I'm so delighted that you two are with us today as you've been such an important teacher and advocate of um, education and connecting and lifting up indigenous life ways and values. You could offer us a, a bit more of that abbreviated introduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chinan, Chinan Asia, um, uh, Willy Jan, and Serote, Melissa Shagnos, Setalan, Yudishio, Kokora, Atlan, Naitini Ana, Kayak, and Siaden, artist, self curator, Gogeshna, Chinan Kotan was at Atlan. It's good to see everyone here today. Um, my my sisters, <laughs> truly, um, so many people that I I love and care about on this call. Um, I, you know, was really excited to be invited into this conversation and, and really, really want to be here as a, as a listener. I would say that a lot of the sort of decolonizing um, the body and representation and our image um, is, is done by so many people in this room. 
Um, I'm starting to investigate that. And I think through uh, more of like physical work and labor, um, particularly through kind of my journey, um, learning about uh, hide tanning and kind of like, what does it mean to make something um, with with body? And then also the, the really incredible physical task it is to tan hides and to scrape them and to pull them pull them apart and break them down um, in, in an honoring way. So yeah, uh, that's that's me. So Chanan uh, and Chanel, Chanan so much to, to Benel too for, for hosting these conversations and allowing us to um, come in and occupy space when we have ideas, you know, uh, that's something that I, I really cherish being able to text Asia or Adele and just say, Hey, I have this idea and we can, we can do something, you know, so um, Chanan for, for that and Chanan Amber for this beautiful theme. I appreciate Holly, how you, I mean, excuse me, Melissa, for how you um, acknowledge that like we're coming from wherever we are and we come as, as um, learners and some are perhaps more in a position of being a teacher, but for, for a dialogue like this, it's so important to have a bunch of different perspectives represented, right? The, 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 um, whether a person considers themselves a novice or an expert, a beginner or a teacher, it's, a, it's about learning together. And so I thank you all from, for coming from, from wherever you are in that life process. I'd like to, um, jump into the conversation with a question to Amber, who, who, who a powerful statement that I might remind you of, Amber, and, and ask you to, to um, elucidate as much as you want. You said, patterns in Native communities are part of a trauma response that's kept us alive. Thank your body for doing what it did to keep you alive and keeping you safe. There's validity in our responses to colonization and part of decolonizing is validating those approaches. You remember when you said that, Amber? <laughs> I, I, I do remember that. I, I think about that. Uh, I remind myself of that every day as I've kind of been, you know, on a journey with myself and you know, with my, with my daughters kind of, um, trying to heal like several generations back and several generations forward. And also really, um, I think that when, when we talk about healing, we have, um, always to keep in our minds that like the way that we think, the way that we kind of, um, are in the world, there aren't a lot of lines you know, like I'm connected to these concepts. I'm connected to these people and there's no, um, the things that I do are going to affect, um, people that I love, you know, and, and, um, I, I think having spent a lot of time not understanding that there was like a block inside of me, like this dis disconnect between being able to feel the land, being able to feel the spirits, it was there, but then at the same time, like most of the native girls that I grew up with were giving themselves tattoos when they were like 14 and 15, you know, like instinctually they had this sense that, that it was time to, to get tattoos, even if maybe we weren't doing traditional tattoos, we, we had that in us. And I think, um, you know, we, we're all really connected to place. So the way that we've experienced trauma is really different depending on if we're able to um, spend time in our ancestral lands, if we're able to spend time around other Native women, if we're able to... Um, be exposed to some of those different resiliency factors. And that's why I think um, this is such an, a, an amazing um, space to be, to be sitting in because like every single person in this room is, 
is doing that and has been doing that and is like leading the way for um for all you know all native women right mm. i have a a lot of different chills while you're speaking because there's so much um power and vulnerability in what you're saying um i i think it's important to you know to um to hear each of you in in response to what amber has said and to give you a chance to develop this dialogue create that space for you hold that space for you does anybody have a, something that they like to share in response to well i love this idea of being a lifelong learner and having that humility that i think you know entering this circle and often um, circles are sacred right and their concepts so it's wonderful to be invited in and i love this idea that this is a healing time for us to come together but also a healing time here forth and back i right? said so when we're healing forward healing backwards such a beautiful uh, concept important and um, looking at that uh, sacredness of the body, how connected it is to place earth as source. So what comes from the earth is our medicine and what we are is from the earth of what we eat and it is the source and we see life go back to it, right? Especially in fall time, but at other times, you know, when we're gifted a harvest and whatnot, we see how connected we are to, to earth as source. And it's just so beautiful, I think, also to reflect that our bodies are related to the celestial as well as to the, the earthly, right? And our cosmology as um, the way we understood the heavens, and part of the reason I chose this, um, the Aurora, is to honor our ancestors, right? Um, and so you can't see the mess behind me, but also really <laughs> because of, our ancestors are ever present guiding us even in the direction from the way that their body is displayed in the heavens. So there's a special shape that, you know, a lot of indigenous people use to navigate, guide and represent our bodies in the sky. And also when I learned traditional healing, each part of our body represents a part of the cosmos. So we're interrelated in a, such as a sacred way. And as women, I think, as potential creators and vessels ourselves, um, such a very important role for us to caretake each other and and the world as as best we can and and do our job all the while. So thanks for listening, Basi Kriana. Melissa, do you want to go next, or shall I? <laughs> I was thinking about um, where we are too in this world um, uh, right now and the history that's come with the treatment of Native women's bodies and the subjugation and marginalization and, you know, murdered and missing Indigenous women, which Amber um, has been very active in and I just admire that so much. Um, that history and that uh, something else that Amber said about um, the patterns of survival and validating those is so important. Um, I think about that a lot. I never had those particular words for it before. So I'm gonna steal those from you, but she's so right that, um, that we um, have been treated badly, marginalized and, and um, murdered and missing and um, the way we've survived and the patterns we created to survive um, need to be validated often in the decolonization um, we want it to happen so fast we forget we have to honor what we did to get there and um, with traditional tattooing which is what I'm doing um, that's what we do. We kind of honor the past by just talking about it. Um, and then with 
you know, every poke that I make through the skin, um, it seems to release if the person's, you know, talking about those issues, it seems to release some of that pain. And um, I worked a lot with Allison and how to listen and how to be there for my, for our people. And I'm so glad she's here as well. And um, yeah, I think something that really struck me was the patterns of our survival need to be validated. And I just want to thank Amber for that. Yeah, that's, that's a, I think a tough statement to follow Holly. <laughs> um, but there's something that, that you said that really resonated with me, Amber, is this idea of kind of like, um, you know, sort of subconsciously listening to your body, you know, and to, and to like your feelings, because, you know, I think that um, we're programmed in society too, um, particularly as, you know, individuals who identify as women here, you know, I think that, um, and as indigenous women, we have like a really prescribed notion as to what we should look like, who we should be, what we should do, um, and also uh, how we should minimize ourselves, you know, and I think that uh, part of decolonization, um, you know, which is, you know, which is an indigenous concept and something I'm very, it's very important to honor, you know, the indigeneity in just, just the word and the notion of decolonization, but decolonization for everyone is this deprogramming of, of, of what we are supposed to look like and who we're supposed to be and what our bodies are supposed to be, you know, that decolonizing is, is also kind of an, an unlearning of, um, of these very sort of like specific codes that we're supposed to like operate within and shape ourselves into in order to fit, you know? Uh, so yeah, I think like really um, listening to those kind of like subconscious needs and, and, um, and, and wants of your body and who you are. Uh, cause, cause I think that in some ways we, we think of that as, uh, is like a very easy thing, particularly when, when talking about indigeneity too, and like indigenous beauty, indigenous sort of like being, um, we kind of like believe like, oh, well you just are, you know, it's like, no, it's like you actually have to deprogram yourself in order to just be in order to feel right in order to get your tattoos in order to operate in a in a body whether it's a larger body or a body that doesn't fit within sort of western standards you know of whatever box you're trying to fit within you know and now i'm just rambling but you know thinking a lot a lot about like the work that amber does you know the work that holly does you know, in the work of Allison, it's, it's all this, it's, it all culminates in, into decolonizing, you know, your body has so many different kind of meanings. I, I think that it's, you know, uh, important to sort of investigate them, which is kind of interesting to have like this very, you know, sort of diverse background and uh, come together and we're all just agreeing. We're like, yeah, <laughs> we get that. <laughs> Dr. K, Allison, there was something you said, um, and I wanted to pick it up. What does it mean um, for a woman to heal forward and to heal back through her body? So that's a, a good question. Physically, what does that mean? Emotionally, spiritually, you know, what is the actual mechanism? We could say that it's a DNA in a sacred spiral, I suppose. Um, uh, but the truth is, is that when you're trained in a very spiritual, sacred way to have intention, we plan to, as traditional healers and tribal doctors, to actually influence people now to help heal those wounds from the past and help to address underlying, maybe it's behavioral or other patterns or spiritual patterns or things that actually can affect health. So dealing with stress um, with more negative coping mechanisms or some such thing. Um, 
so that when we talk and share space and experience a healing story and maybe tweak our story a little bit so it has positivity, hope, and healing, or maybe includes medicines of different types, um, then we can transform our story for the future and maybe even for um, the future of people other than us. Hmm. That's powerful. Anybody want to respond to that? It's so powerful. I, I would I would like to respond to that. Um, I think uh, that uh, the concept of of kind of um, being able to help people through those processes is so I, I think that that's a really profound gift that some people have to be able to lead people to those places like it's like you're creating a pathway where there was like a negative behavior by giving someone an experience where they can feel a pathway toward lightness right so one of the things that i really wanted to to say um after listening to everyone speak is that um you know when we do come together in that way, like as we're all refining how we support each other and how we um, like kind of set down kind of the div divisive patterns that were put on us, you know, that we then you know, for a long time put on each other in different ways. Like as we're setting those down, it's, it's like um, anytime you create that group setting, you know, you, you, you can, create space for people to find those pathways. And I think um, having been through some like uh, Native Wellness Institute um, circles and some all kinds of different um, places where women are healing, I, I think, you know, that's part of the beauty of being women. And, and really like when I think about any other Native women where I used to have like feelings of reservation and, and some fear. Now, no matter what's happening in my mind, I'm always thinking, uh, you know, I, every, single, every single one of us, I want to win, you know? Like I'm uplifting, even if I'm seeing behaviors that I understand to be like um, challenging for people, I, I think there's so much power in sending that, that energy up and I think especially um, in this room. I, I don't know Allison as, as well, but with Melissa and Holly, I see you guys doing that all the time with, with young women, with older women, with all different kinds of native women. I see you guys really um, creating space for that. And I think it's really powerful to, um, to, to see that. That's so sweet, Amber. And I love you. <laughs> I miss you. It's been so long. But, um, you know, working with Allison and trying to figure out how to do that the right way. Um, I was so lucky over COVID to sit with her once a month. And But even before that, we, when we set out to do this, um, I had, we had hoped with traditional tattooing to to do that, to give people a place to talk about their stuff and, and not like a non-judgmental home uh, to bring people into and like just discuss and, and, you know, then leave with this amazing tattoo. So I'm so glad that, um, and I'm so privileged to work with so many young people and, and elders and um, it's just, like, if I could make my life, if I could have built my life, I would have never dreamed it would be so um, supportive and lovely. And I just want to uh, pay that forward. And then, of course, I, I do it with my other warriors who are here <laughs> on this call. And I love that. And um, yeah, so thank you. But um, you're also doing the work. And um, I hope I can support you as much as I can. Holly, you, you 
inferred right there about healing forward and healing backward. And um, something about your work to me and to many people is is changing um, changing stories, changing women's stories. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the change that you're witnessing when you think about the work that you do with women over time and in community over time. What kind of um, different narratives do you feel um, might be? Well, emerging? definitely, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, definitely a, a change in our beauty standards, right? Like we have this one beauty standard, uh, that kind of Hollywood standard, and um, most of us don't fit in that. So wearing our traditional tattoos and, and changing the way that we think about ourselves, um, feeling beautiful, but beautiful in, in our own terms, um, and then facing the world. And, and people are learning. I feel like the community, I live in Anchorage and the community here is learning. And um, I get less and less questions, which is wonderful because I, I hate to spend all my time um, educating other people. I would rather just educate our own people. Um, and then um, other people learn just by teaching us, right? Like. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's wonderful. I, I was reflecting on how many hundreds of tattoos and I've done. And had you told me I would have hundreds of women walking around Anchorage with uh, face markings, I, I wouldn't have believed you. And um, now we have hundreds and hundreds. I, I don't even know them. So I feel like um, that in itself is a statement to this decolonization, right? Like this idea of changing the world and reminding them that we're still here and we're still proud people and um, making the outside think, but also making our own people think about what's beautiful and um, what our bodies don't have to look like that standard. In fact, they don't. It's, it's unattainable for most Americans, right? So um, I'm sure Melissa and, and can say, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, I, I would love to hear Melissa's response. And, and I was also just wondering if you could remind me of the space and time that you have been doing this work, the, the number of years, I'm just trying to remember exactly. Uh, it's been, a, I've been tattooing about six years, um, but planning this project about seven and a half, eight years. And mm -hmm. if I think back, um, I started it when I was about 15, mm -hmm. you know, just takes a, a long journey to get where well, you're actually practicing. But um, yeah. I remember wanting the tattoos from a traditional healer, a traditional practitioner as young as 15. Just just about the age that Amber was speaking of. When she just was... a few years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, Ollie. But it is. Time goes by super fast, right? Inside of every one of us is that is a 15 year old girl still. Can, can I ask a question? Please. Um, I, I'm just curious, um, Allison, um, I'm curious to hear more about, um, so I guess some of the, I, I mean, I can imagine being in the medical field um, with, with some of the history around our like our bodies in medicine and some of the things that have happened to you know people people in Alaska people all over the United States um I'm curious to know like have you have how have how have you found um support as you've as you've moved through these places that's a beautiful question, Amber. I'm grateful for that question. Um, 
um, you make it a priority. You know, sometimes I read these things and they say, maybe we can do one to two things well, some people up to three things well. So I figure I can try to do my studies or, you know, be a provider or be a teacher and maybe care for myself, maybe. Um, and I wrap my family and friends into that, right? So I'm kind of like stretching to, to get to that place. And one of the things that I do to care for self is create a council everywhere I am and now it's digitally. So that council is super important for me. So that's folks like maybe some of my aunties, Ida Hildebrand, Miranda Wright, Eleanor Laughlin, uh, my mom, um, my dad, my sisters, Sonia Kelleher Combs, Carla Gingrich, right? I just was real blessed to have some wonderful sounding boards and really creative folks who really also believe that that art, I believe, is um, the the culmination of a, of a healing experience, right? So art is a, a, a tremendous opportunity for us to express ourselves as as conscious, sentient beings, and then experience a, um, something that's healing and pleasing and and illustrative, right, and so, of something important. Um, so what I would say is that even if it's just one person, because um, before cell phones even, it was really hard, and my family stays at camp a lot, and it's hard to get hold of them, even I have to wait till my mom and dad come up the hill to get cell service, right? So I have to kind of strategically have someone that I can hold space with ceremonially for real, right? So there I'm going to, to learn something in a traditional way or be in a traditional way in my new place. And for me here in, in North and South Dakota, that's been going to Bear Butte um, in South Dakota and praying at uh, Rita Blumenstein's 40 day feast and just having a true tremendous amazing opportunity to honor you know what I've learned which is that in in the future times in the now times we're able to connect across grandmother spider web and connect all indigenous people across the world and have this amazing tremendous dialogue so so let's be a resource to each other, right? And also pay attention to, as you were saying, how it feels in our body. When there's someone that we resonate with, that's a someone, that's a someone for us. <laughs> and it's like, um, it just takes, I think some time, especially with us having ex different experiences, maybe becoming comfortable with a trauma type reaction or, or feeling comfortable in, a, in some kind of dysfunctional setting. Um, I'm not excluded from that, right? So, and in our smaller communities, I think that sometimes it's harder for us to learn those skills about who is a really supportive mentor for us and, and teaches us in a way that is nurturing. So paying attention to those, those feelings in our body, how it truly feels when we're meeting and connecting with folks and then fostering those, but it doesn't have to be more than one. Okay, so I, I went on and on, but that's, that's how I, I do it. So <laughs> Koyana, uh, Masi Cho, Masi. Thank you. Amber, can I, could I be so bold as to turn the question back to you? How, how are you supported? How do you find the support? Here you are a mother, an artist and a healthcare provider, you know, living in rural Alaska. How are you finding support? Well, um, I find support in, in places like this. Um, I find a lot of what I've been learning lately is just like how to be joyful and like how to let my own joy in the world support me. Like that that can be something that supports me enough to carry me through those times where I don't have support. Um, I have, my mom's really supportive. My sister's really supportive, but you know, it can be really, um, really challenging. Um, like I, sometimes those places that are the most important to us are the places where we experience the most violence, you know, and, and I think this last 
two years has been really challenging in that way. And I'm, I'm hoping that some of the leadership in my own community are going to stand up and say, you know, we are allowed to make space for ourselves because I see a lot of people in my own community kind of adhering to these, you know, those, those colonial ideas about who we are and, and, and putting those on each other, especially on, on our young people and uh, gosh, you know, I guess that's why it, it just feels so good to be talking to you ladies because it's been a pretty rough couple of years, but um, I think, you know, like what I think about, the other thing that I think about all the time, especially if I'm, I'm alone is like, especially when I'm struggling is I, I understand that some of our challenges like suicide, addiction, all manner of responses that we've had to this trauma didn't come from us. And I will not let that, that colonial um, like imprint steal anything else from me ever again. Like if I'm moving in a direction, I'm putting that stuff down because the only space I have right now is for like finding a way to be a joyful example so that people like so that people who maybe grew up feeling the way I felt can be like hey I can just enjoy myself you know <laughs> like I, I don't have to I don't have to carry that around I can just be happy and like sometimes that's I, I don't even know if I'm answering your question but I think I guess I'm still really developing that right now <laughs> Yeah, we, and you're radiating it at the same time somehow, incredibly. Thank you. Melissa, you make yourself a resource in so many ways. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the ways that you do. I know that you also have a very strong network. And when Allison was speaking about that, I, I was thinking about how often you um, acknowledged your aunties and your advisors and wondered if you could talk about some of the ways that you um you built this network that, that's a great time yeah you know um i think it kind of like directly kind of um relates back to you know what allison and uh, amber are talking about and you know that these ideas of decolonizing um is it's really to it's really difficult to be done on your own, right? It's like you need to do them within groups and with within your network and within your support systems. You know, it's like decolonizing. Um, you know, I think that, I think that, well, you know, actually may, maybe it's just a response. It's a response to, you know, anything that we do, <laughs> we have to do together because doing it on our own is something that we've been really trained as to being this sort of putting ourselves in danger or to be the othering kind of system, you know? And I think that, um, you know, I work really closely with Holly on a lot of projects. And I think that a way that, that we're able to move forward is in support of each other. And also kind of like in this way of um, like, okay, well, I, I need to address this thing. I'm gonna bring, with me my support system and my my people in order to help me um say this difficult thing or educate in this difficult way oftentimes in my workshops i'll i'll ask like a friend if they you know if they could be around and i'll like cook them dinner if they'll just like show up because it's sometimes nice to have like an ally planted <laughs> you know in in an within an audience because I think sometimes when you're working in, in anything, um, to be indigenous is to, is to in many ways, be in this kind of um, resistance, you know? And 
I, I want to sort of push back against that because the things that Amber's talking about, the joy and, you know, finding um, the beauty and uh, the, the, the content, contentedness of, of being indigenous is really what I think we're all trying to get towards in order to just be able to live our full selves, you know, as indigenous people within these indigenous bodies um, and not have to be made uncomfortable, you know? And so I think that in some ways, like what we're talking about is, is, is how do we, how do we strategize in order to get to that place, you know? And I think that each one, each person here does that in a different way, right? You know, uh, in decolonizing, you know, the, the physical sort of form. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like I, I've built my network truly just through, through friends and through, uh, kind of like a careful, a careful, um, uh, revealing of my truth, you know, to find allies, <laughs> you know? Um, and like, uh, I think that that's, that's, it's, it's pretty apparent when you go into a room or a place and you reveal something about yourself and, uh, I think everyone knows being like, okay, all right, I guess for this group, I need to pull that back or I need to leave altogether because this isn't a place that um, accepts that truth. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, uh, yeah, I think that at least everyone here, Amber and Holly, like Allison, I think, uh, you know, I'm very close with with Allison's sister, Sonia. And so in some ways it was kind of like <laughs> ally and sister by association. <laughs> but um, but, you know, I think that in some ways, like we've we've all built relationships with each other, you know, through this kind of like sharing of ourselves, you know, and building that trust, you know, um, I mean, I was first really interested in, in Amber's work, you know, on, on the, the white cuss book. And then we ended up building something that was just like really beautiful and communal and, and the sharing of, of opportunity and, and, uh, and like social sort of networking and capital amongst ourselves, you know, and this, the same with Holly, you know, it's like we work together and, and Holly is, always trying to find um, opportunities and and share sort of like ideas and space with me in a way that like as a young artist and an artist who, you know, a few years ago was just starting out, I uh, never, never expected anyone of Holly's caliber to do that, you know, so I think in some ways like these doll decolonizing of bodies, protect particularly like within sort of femme bodies and feminism, um, comes from also this sort of mentorship, you know, this mentorship of, of, of women and femme people and, and how it is that we uh, support each other in those things. Because in so many ways we've been <sighs> exploited, you know, not only just for our bodies, but for, for our ideas. And we continue to be. Um, but if we do things together, if I do things with Holly, if I do things with Amber, if I do things with Allison, it's almost like you're you're kind of like spreading the power, you know, so like we're all together. And because I think that doing any of the work we do alone, we're, we're at a great risk. And it's a risk that most white artists don't have to experience. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm thinking, I'm really interested in, in hearing others' response to that. I, I just wanted to comment that I, I appreciate, um, Allison, how you elucid elucidated this idea of um, a network of support as a form of resistance to colonization. That because, and I just want, I felt it might be interesting to reflect on, colonization is a, is a systemic um, tool of, of disempowerment. So it, at its heart, it, it isolates, it breaks down, it um, alienates and subjugates women and bodies and peoples. And so the resistance of the fibers of the community, of the networks of kinship, of the associations of sharing have such value. I'm so um, grateful that you brought that up and, and how you each speak to that in 
in your lives. And I wondered, Allison, if you had any follow-up comments to some of these thoughts that have been shared, or Holly, perhaps. I'm so grateful to hear what we're all sharing in this space. So I'm happy to just um, reflect that from my perspective in Western medicine or from many Western um, dogmas and uh, paradigms or pedagogies, whatever word that's, you know, patriarchy, whatever P word you want to use, I jokes, um, but uh, um, the, that things have to be some way, right? So then it's strep throat, then the penicillin. Okay, very good. So it's a very linear process. And, you know, in many, there are many other ways to treat many other things, not that we shouldn't be treating strep throat with penicillin, okay? We should use science and, and, and people had indigenous science and indigenous people um, appreciate science, right? So um, I would say that, what I'm reflecting on and hearing all of us speak is that Western makes us be some way and in some specific way. And in the indigenous perspective, um, we kind of go with things in a resilient way, right? So we learn, oh, this worked pretty good. Let's pass that on. And then if something works better, let's consider that cautiously practice it, practice it, be aware, be conscious, right? And uh, this idea that important messages come back again and again, um, that we should slowly implement important changes and be conscious of how it influences the group. And, you know, this is the work that I think women and indigenous women, and I know Athabascan women were doing, we planned the year, right? So the women would get together and, hey, where are we gonna gather and how are we gonna trade? And then, you know, we've got to trade with folks down in Dillingham and folks in Cotsview and get all our goods, our goods from everywhere. So it's important that we know each other. And it's, these are real true relationship-based knowledge systems and resiliency that continues, right, to exist. The thing is, it's not really, um, always been extensively written about or documented or validated on all of these Western ways. And so I think the new science will bring, bring that in, will bring into light how valuable it is for us to feel connected to each other and to source. So it's just a matter of time. Some elders say that's seven generations. So I try to not be judgy of that, just try to enjoy it as Amber said. <laughs> Thank you. I think, sorry, is that okay? Okay, I Please. think first I wanna respond to Melissa that she is like one of my biggest support people. And I am so grateful for her always being there for me and listening to my responses to many uh, requests. And I, I love you so much and I hope you never sell yourself short because you're freaking amazing. Um, but with that said, um, th the idea of creating support is so valuable, uh, uh, especially to struggling people, any people, but native people to find, to reconnect with family and, uh, and people who are doing good things. I'm working um, on a project in the YK Delta um, to show kids in that area, local people doing things on their own, that just inspiring the next generation to do something um, positive. It doesn't have to be in the Western system. You know, uh, we'd like to show, we're trying to show hunters and fishermen and all kinds of things, um, just positive ways to cope with the, the lives uh, that they're living and, and how to build the life that you want. So um, I, th I think about that even in tattooing because we really do build the lives that we want and you make decisions um, that either enhance your life or, or, or teach you something. <laughs> and um, uh, never being judgy as Allison said, 
and, and just being open and willing to uh, learn. And I find the more open I am, the more that I learn, the more that comes to me um, organically. Um, and, and these kind of discussions um, with other Native people, um, all kinds of things just are get into my head and then I, I just live with them until it comes together. So um, they're so valuable in this work of decolonizing and helping our communities uh, overcome the traumas um, of colonization, which includes, you know, all kinds of trauma. Um, and yeah, so I guess I'm just saying, yeah, Allison, and yeah, Melissa, and yeah, Amber. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so great. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Holly, I want to hear a little bit more about that project in the YK Delta. Could you talk a little bit more about the means or the um, methods that you're employing to spread that power? Yeah, so I work, I've worked a long time with um, Quebec Fisheries, which is a, oh my God, Allison, QDC, <laughs> a community or CDQ. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a CDQ. Yeah, CDQ, <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I've worked with them as a graphic designer and web person for years and years, but what they do is important work in the YK Delta um, in fisheries, but um, because fisheries was not a thing this year, um, they're, and, and in the last five years it's been diminishing. So they're looking at other ways to um, uh, bring up the community and, and not just economically, but, um, in many ways, They're, they've been real creative. And, and what they did with me or what I talked them into doing is this video project, which we will um, bring to each of their six villages, the YDFDA villages. And, and again, it's just showing local people doing good things in their own lives. And then talking about those things. And then I had the people reflect and, and maybe give advice to those kids like what would you say to your own kids and, and what do you say to your own kids and um even you know and they were sharing that on film but even reflecting on it is a teaching tool do you know what i mean um and having the kids around we worked with the kids this summer and traveled to the villages and um, just recording that. Something cool we're doing too is uh, Davion Patton, who's a uh, young, he's 16. He uh, is a young musician here in town. We hired him to do the soundtrack for uh, these videos. So there will be like kind of a music video and then these little snippets of advice and what people are doing, the interviews. So we're trying to create something that's just positive. You know, that shows community, shows people that they've probably seen around but don't know their story, um, maybe create dialogue, um, you know, just trying to do difference with YDFDA and Quickback Fisheries. Fabulous. Fabulous. Thanks so much for sharing that. So we're, we're getting close to the end of our hour to, to share. And I wanted to invite um, each of you uh, to offer any closing comments or remarks, questions or ideas for on future conversations. And the one that, the question that I have for each of you is um, if you had the resources, human funds, uh, superpowers um, to make, um, to make a change that that you long to see, um, small or large, very local or very global, through the work that you are so invested in, artistic work, healing work. What would that look like? Well, this gets me super excited. Um, because I think that traditional life ways and traditional medicines, which are 
many different types, right? Um, body, mind, spirit. So the way we think, the way we live, um, how we are in relationship with each other and um, the source, Mother Earth and our bodies and ourselves, that is all traditional medicine. So what I think is that it would be beneficial for all of us if there were traditional healers and traditional healing incorporated into modern medicine. Thank you. Piece of cake. I think too, the way that uh, people uh, approach us and look at us, I'd like that to change. Um, um, I'm, I, every opportunity that comes my way, I think about that and before I respond, I think about how, how I can do that in this little, you know, in this little way, whatever it be. Um, I recently had Vogue magazine reach out um, because uh, amazing Cleon is uh, was on the cover of their European magazine, but they wanted to feature us. Well, I w I had a moment where I was like, oh, how cool! And then when you think about it what do I want to promote with them? You know what I mean? I don't want to promote the stereotypical mm. uh, model right. with fancy clothes. I want to promote respect for uh, our culture, for Alaskan native culture, for um, these revivals that um, are spiritual and sacred. And how can I do that without... Um, with trusting another person to write that or to photograph it. Um, so finding other native people who are working to do that, I think that's important and, and to request it. And when um, requests are denied or, or ignored to insist, you know, every opportunity to insist that we're doing right. And this is where I talk to Melissa all the time. Um, how do I say that to them so they know that I'm insisting? Because culturally, I don't want to fight, like, uh, but I want to insist. So, um, yeah, uh, Melissa and I talk all the time about that, about how to how to do that and get what we want, <laughs> which is fairness, you know, and and to promote the right thing. Like, I don't want to. Um, tell our girls that that's the standard. That is not the standard in my eyes. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see that change the way people approach us. Thank you, Holly. Thanks. Um, I think I would, I would really like to see uh, us take control over our image and our like oh, completely control over that you know I think that um part of decolonizing is is really really teaching institutions teaching galleries teaching universities all these places that you know that our history that our 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 lectures, our events, our, our image, our exhibitions, you know, that they can't be done without us and that it truly is today very, I mean, always has been, but particularly today, an inappropriate thing for people to try to do these things without us, you know, I think it was in, it's in Minnesota somewhere, but they're, they're just doing this new exhibition on, Edward Curtis photos of um, of Inupiaq and Alaskan, you know, Inuit people. Uh, but still there's, yeah, I know. It's like still today, we're still at square one, but it, it's, um, there, there's, there is no discussion about like our image being used any more in that, you know? And so I, I want it to like, there to be a shift that if you're going to talk about indigenous things, decolonizing things, things that involve our bodies, you're not allowed to do them, at least without us, and and even going as far as saying um, without us controlling it. You know, um, I think that that's, that that's really important because the truth is all these, all these things, all these museums, institutions, universities, grants, 
they they want our magic they want our specialness you know i mean there's a reason why why 90 percent of museum collections are indigenous objects you know it's because there is something really special about those things and it, and we all and the entire society can appreciate them but we should be able to have some control over that and control over those things um, because those are very much a part of our bodies. They're very much a part of our connection to those things. And um, yeah, so I, I would like to see kind of a, a, a pedagogical shift, you know, in, in, uh, in how anything that involves Indigenous people um, becomes also like Indigenous choice and power. So, yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Amber, I invite you, I encourage you to take the last word because your word is good. I would love to hear what your thoughts are on um, power that um, you, if you could have, you know, the opportunity to do the work that you desire to do at the highest level what resources do you do you need? Uh, so, um, gosh, all of all of the things that you guys are talking about are just like so exciting, and uh, I think for me, what what I see, you know, living in a rural area, I see a lot of non Indigenous people that are making a lot of money and and um, taking a lot of things from from my people um, and I see that happening consistently and I see that happening in a community of people that um, continues to um, to struggle and I, I would like to see decision makers be indigenous people and I would like to see our indigenous sovereignty all across the state be recognized and the other thing if I had like a magic wand and I could like wield this magic wand I would remove those barriers from our the minds of our leadership that where like when they when they put us in these boarding schools and and they took that intergenerational connection from so many of our people so many of us became convinced that that was the right way out of fear. We have this trauma response to like speaking indigenous, speaking from an indigenous perspective and really embodying that. And if I had a magic wand, I would just remove that from people's existence. I, because I think if we did that, our all of our decision makers would be, would be like um, more, uh, unified and I, and I think that if we could um, if we really were able to um, direct our our science and our our like environmentalism and all of that a lot of the challenges that we're facing wouldn't be challenges anymore um, and especially you know, especially in our our smaller places where um, it's like you can see that the the law isn't even on your side, you know, sometimes. And maybe that's I don't know if that's too raw, but if if it if I could do anything, you know, we have we have all of these um, opportunities for healing, and our people are doing the work, and I see these gatekeepers in the way of that work being done and so I would just lose them right on thank you so much thank you all so much you're so deeply inspiring and articulate it's been really a pleasure to spend an hour with you talking about decolonizing bodies and I just want to invite um you all and our, our listeners to share your ideas for conversations that you want to be a part of in the future. Thank you.
جنان جنان قيم